tell when you might need it. <laughs> Hey, hey, we're back up here in the Heartland Cafe, and we are j jacked up. We are, we are so happy singing to uh, Sweet Honey of the Rock. You know, it was like uh, many years ago in 1963, <laughs> around this date, uh, I was at the Washington Monument, or the Lincoln Memorial, and Both. for the March on Washington. And uh, it was one of the most moving experiences I ever had in my life. And I know people, there are a lot of events going on around its anniversary. Uh, but the main one will be uh, <coughs> people out there, among others, organizing to change a few things that are going on. And uh, we're going to have David Orr, who's a longtime advocate for expanding voter rights, up on the show a little later. But we're going to start off with two of our friends. Uh, we have Ma Maria Moreno and Victoria Cervantes. Bienvenido. La Voz de la Buenos Abajo. dias. Buenos dias. Good morning. Good and to have you back. these two women are just back from Honduras. And uh, they are going to have a kind of a report tomorrow uh, taking place to tell, tell us about on their most recent trip. But we got them before they're doing that report. And we're going to find out how the trip was. So good morning to both of you. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. So, Victoria, you've been here before. Yes. And maybe you should briefly tell people that your group and what your history is. Right. Um, our group is La Voz de los de Abajo, which means the voice of those below. It was founded about 15 years ago. We're going into our anniversary. And we started doing solidarity work with people in Honduras, with the Campesino movement, the unions, the social justice movements, right after Hurricane Mitch. So we've been traveling back and forth a long time doing different projects, radio, all different kinds of solidarity. And of course, since the military coup in June of 2009, we've been really doubling up the work to get people to go down there and see the situation. Vicki, uh, let's just tell uh, our listeners a little bit about uh, Honduras. Uh, you know, there was a large military presence by the U.S. there. It seemed a tamer Central American country for a long time, although I think they had a soccer war yeah, but one <laughs> way back. And, uh, and there was a lot of contra activity out of there into Nicaragua back during those, uh, those struggling days for Nicaragua. But what's it been like? All of a sudden it emerged. Uh, suddenly there was a, a sort of a, a movement for more rights, etc. There was a coup. Uh, and then a lot of repression with the U.S. being somewhat implicated in at least not standing up when they might have. Yeah, Honduras for, for years and years and years, the United States used it and still does, or it tries to as a military base. Um, it's very strategically located. It's right in the middle of Central America. For many years in the 1980s, the United States uh, used it to train the Contras. They used it to, to 
assist in military operations against the uh, movement in El Salvador, in Guatemala, and in Nicaragua. Uh, it was very heavy handed, although I want to say that now the United States has six military bases in Honduras. So the U.S. military presence has not diminished. That's one thing that's important to see. Um, Honduras was, because probably of this military occupation, it was considered to be more controlled. But of course, like all countries, there was a lot of movement for social and economic justice going on all those years. And when um, Zelaya, President Zelaya was elected, uh, this movement started to, to pressure more and for some reason, we don't really know why, he responded and started making reforms, the movement started growing and that, of course, is when the coup was organized and the U.S. was definitely implicated in the coup in June 2009. Whew. Well, there was a certain role Hillary Clinton played in that, wasn't there? Oh, yeah. The, at, at the, people might not realize that there's a, actually a law in the, United, in the U.S. that if a government, if there's a coup, a military coup, and the U.S. Declare, recognizes that it was a coup, they're supposed to cut off military aid and security aid because theoretically we're not supposed to finance such atrocities against the civilians. And right after the coup in, in Honduras, Honduras, uh, everybody knew it was a coup, and we know from WikiLeaks that the U.S. ambassador in Honduras, even though he knew it was coming, he still wrote a very honest memo to the White House and State Department saying it's a coup, it's illegal. Uh, however, the State Department decided to say that it wasn't really a coup, that it was a something, I don't know what, a mystery, something. Um, and they actually blocked there being a cutoff of all the aid. They made only a few symbolic gestures against the military coup. Wow. Well, um, Maria, this was, your, was this your first time going down there? Yes, it was. And what were your impressions and what was the trip about? I know there were a number of different groups that went along with La Voz. Uh, yes, I, uh, I found it very inspirational. Um, we went, a group of teachers and also youth um, from Chicago. Um, we went in solidarity uh, to observe and see what was happening in the resistance. And uh, I was deeply moved to see how the different groups in Honduras have been standing up for their rights to make change for a better Honduras. And you've been busy standing up for your rights too. I understand you are from the Chicago Teachers Union and you are a CPS teacher. Yes. And, and you uh, teach kids who are really challenged. Yes, I am a speech therapist um, and I'm also a member of the Chicago Teachers Union, proud member. Um, we've been very active you know, recently in the fight against uh, the school closures, but also in demanding you know, better management of the schools for our schools in our neighborhoods that need so much support. Um, and so it's good to see the solidarity in Honduras and seeing that we're also putting up a fight. How many people were on this last trip? There were 15. There were seven educators six of whom were CTU members and one was from uh, out of state but also a teacher. And there were five youth from the fearlessly leading youth group down on the south side. What's that called? Fearlessly leading youth, fly. <laughs> part of the South Side Together Organizing for nice. Power group that, that we work with a lot. And then we were accompanied by uh, one of the leaders of the Campesino organization at Honduras we work with, so, and two La Voz people. And were there Radio Populares types too? They came down at the, real, I was there a month, almost a month, more than three weeks, and the Radio Populares people came about halfway, um, and we did some collaboration on radio projects. Those and are a group of people, they've been on our show a number of times, they set up little guerrilla radio stations in communities and barrios to spread the word about social action. They do great work, so uh, we had a total at one time or the other of 19 people. Uh, right, so around. what did you do while you were there? I, I think the headline of what you did would be that you met with the ousted president Zayla in his <laughs> living Zelaya. You know, my pronunciation is rough on any in any language. Uh, <laughs> tell us about meeting with him, because he's certainly a guy who's been uh, running through the jungle, fighting fighting off all kind of things. Um, yes, uh, we. Um, we got an invitation to go visit him at his home, and uh, we all gathered in his living room. And uh, when he finally, they offered us refreshments, and he finally came in. Very, very calm man, and uh, 
uh, he spoke a bit about you know what had been going on in the country, and then he, we, we were able to ask him different questions, you know, and we found him very, um, you know, very genuine about his desire to see a better Honduras for the people, the actual common person in, in Honduras, and so. Um, we went away feeling very honored to have been in his home. Really? Do you have any sense about his plans? Uh, it was really interesting. He, he was, he's very optimistic about the elections coming up November 24th, his national elections. His wife is the candidate for president running for the resistance party, which is called Libre, or Free Freedom Party. Um, he was very optimistic. She's running way ahead in all the polls, even like the Gallup poll. Um, he's optimistic that there won't be another coup or any out of control violence. I don't know if I share all that optimism. But one thing he really wanted us to, to bring back with us was the importance of people in the United States and in other countries, but especially the United States, to accompany them, to come down and visit, and to work to get military and police aid cut off from the United States to Honduras. He made a really big point of that. Are you, uh, are you as convinced as, as uh, the former president that there won't be any opposition or any blocking of the results if his wife does win? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm really, we're very concerned as an organization because what we're seeing is uh, continued violence and very targeted violence. I mean, Honduras is a violent country. What There's kind a of lot. violence? I mean, are we talking about activists for example, getting... Yeah, well, for just while we were there, in, in the th more than three weeks I was there, uh, the wi a member of the Libre Party, the wife of a candidate in a, a, a province called Olancho, was in her car and was gunned down. And then they showed on the TV over and over and over again the car which was riddled. I mean, we're talking hundreds of bullets. And it was all plastered with stickers for the Libre Party. So she was assassinated and then they like passed the message on by showing this looping it over and over again on the news. A an indigenous activist was gunned down by the army in a, in a struggle called Rio Blanco where the community uh, which is part of the resistance is, is also opposing a hydroelectric plan. Uh, there was another journalist was killed and the body of a journalist who had gone missing a few weeks before I got there was found. I mean, I could, there's so, the list is so long that I hesitate to just keep going. You know, but the point is, is that the conditions for a free election, it's, it's very difficult for the opposition, but they just keep going. So, you know, this is uh, unfortunately reminiscent of many different stories we know from Chile to Argentina, I mean, to Nicaragua and Guatemala, etc. cetera. Um, and and uh, what's distressing to me is that it, the U.S. took part in this as recently as 2009. Yep. Um, we're about to have a, an event here next week that talks about repression and political repression and... Uh, in the in the era of in Obama. the era of Obama, there's another word: the political repression and something else. In any case, I'd say it says political political repression here and now. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, anyway, I, did did President former President Zelaya ask you why Obama is to getting involved in this sort of thing? <laughs> no. No. He made no, no difference he made between no difference. He, he made any no difference. administration and the next. Yeah. It's very sad to me that that I, can be happening. What is either of your sense about the U.S.'s role going forward? I mean, if we, if we have a legitimate election and the Freedom Party were to win, uh, do you think the U.S. will stand by the election this time? You're doubtful, but... I'm, I'm concerned. I think that what worries me is the close ties that the U.S. military and U.S. government have with the Honduran military. And what we saw this trip, even more than all our previous, uh, an incredible militarization. There, it's hard to believe, but there are even more checkpoints. We also saw soldiers in, u in combat uniforms. There's officially no war at the checkpoints. We saw soldiers in uniforms with heavy arms patrolling side by side with private security guards in the big uh, plantations where there's land conflicts. And the U.S. trains 
arms, has very close ties with the Honduran military. So that's what makes me really concerned is that, is that I don't know that the U.S. would do more than a, a, a token yeah, a token statement or something. So do we know if uh, the Jimmy Carter group or the international groups that observe elections is going to be present for the Honduran elections this November? I haven't heard for sure about the Carter Institute. I know that Libre was, was planning to invite them. The Organization of American States election observers will be there. There'll be diff other European Union, the ALBA countries, the South American countries just had a delegation there mm. and they'll be there and we're organizing different groups in the United States to take as many people as we can also. Wow. Maria, what would you uh, recommend for your friends, neighbors, students um, that they know or do or be in with your newest experience of uh, diplomacy, if you will, citizen diplomacy? Well, I would um, encourage them to actually Call their uh, elected representatives. Um, uh, call you know the their senators and congressmen. Um, let them know that they oppose um, this heavily militarized you know presence in Honduras. What a good uh, idea. Yeah, you know, and, and you know when the CTU meets, we're going to present a, a resolution also uh, in support of the struggle that's occurring in Honduras and uh, you know popularizing this in, in the states and saying no, we have to stop this and uh, allow these people to have you know their democratic elections. Maria is a, a school teacher here in Chicago who's involved in the struggle for better schools. Well, what do you take from your, your visit there that you would uh, share with other teachers, parents, uh, here in Chicago where the battle reigns? Well, I found it um, very um, eye-opening how the teachers are in the forefront of this struggle. Yeah. Um, you know, they were the ones that were out there in the thousands right after the coup, and they've been continuously organizing. And what we're seeing, what I saw there was, it goes beyond just the bread and butter that you would see in a union. They are more of fighting about society as a whole, you know, in all fronts. Um, in Chicago, recently, our union also has been transforming itself into more of just the bread and butter issues, but more in a, a, a social justice unionism, looking beyond just our own interests, and that we're all united in this. You so, can't pull one thread without connecting exactly. to the rest. And so I think that solidarity, bringing it back home, and said, look, this is what the teachers are doing there, this mm. is what we need to do in our own country, in our own city, in yeah. our own neighborhoods also. Well, I you both are involved with La Voz, and uh, you have a special event taking place tomorrow. And uh, why don't you share with us that information and what people are going to get when they come to this event. We're going to be having a report back tomorrow, Sunday, August 18th, 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. at the Mestli Gallery and Cultural Center. That's M-E-Z-T-L-I. And that's at 2005 South Blue Island Avenue in Pilsen. A really nice cultural space. We're going to have a little music, a little video. We'll have teachers, students, La Voz, talking about our experiences, and we're going to have some solidarity actions, a petition to sign, and birthday greeting to record for one of the Campesino political prisoners, uh, Chavelo Morales. We're also going to be doing petition work and letters so we can send them off to Congress uh, against the military aid. So it's going to be a, a good event. What, and time, we, what time does that happen? 6 p.m. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Uh -huh. Uh, let me ask you, uh, how many people from Honduras are living in Chicago that we know of? Oh, you know, I'm not sure. It's not an enormous number. Uh, there, I mean, there are some thousands in the in the whole region. The biggest concentrations of Hondurans are in New Orleans and Virginia and uh, New Jersey. <laughs> okay. But well, any of those states, we need their vote down the line. Yeah. So the other thing that you're carrying around, and I bet you're going to leave some on the free literature rack here at the Heartland, is uh, the invitation to join you in November for the uh, Human Rights and Election Observer Delegation, which okay. is uh, options exist from November 18th to 27th, or a shorter one, uh, November 21st to 26th, which I always like to encourage people to get out of 
the belly of the beast and see us from without because there is no education faster, quicker, deeper than that. One more time, give us a website uh, where people can find out information, Facebook page, whatever you got. Well, we have Facebook, La Voz de los de Abajo, <laughs> and we have a blog spot where you can get updates and find out how to contact us, and that is HondurasResists.blogspot.com. We have reports from all of our trips and information on the delegation in November, which we really encourage people to think about coming with us. Um, the Honduran people are asking us to come, and I think people will find it transformative for your own lives as well, because you really see people in movement. It's gonna be a cold November up here, so people are probably are gonna to wanna to go south. We wanna thank Maria Maduro and Vicky Cervantes for coming on the Live from the Heartland show. You're always, uh, you're always welcome here. You always give me a lot of inspiration about uh, lots of things. Thanks again. Thanks, Thanks Maria Moreno. Thank you. And we'll Thanks be right back with more Live from the Heartland. We've got a guy named Dan downtown. He's picking a tune. He's going to play it. And we're going to bring our neighbor, our friend, our, one of our leaders, David Orr, is going to be right here. Stay tuned here on the left end of your dial, WLUW 88.7 Chicago's. Sound Alliance. Sail.